Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so this is the part, I think we've officially entered the part of the course where people stop showing up because the last homework was already due. And, but in any event, it's nice to see some of you guys here. Uh, <laughs> I hope your, your projects are going well. Uh, so there's office hours. Let's see, I have office hours tomorrow morning. You moved yours to sometime. Three to five. Uh, there are still nano quizzes left in this class, so I'll get, I'll get to see you at least once every four lectures. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think the rest of this course is pretty straightforward organizationally. Are there any, any questions about things going on? I always ask, nobody ever responds. No? Ah, okay. Uh, cool. Well, um, right, so this is the part of the course where finally we're out of the, the, the hot water, we're done talking about discrete exterior calculus and all these other things that probably visibly made your instructor uncomfortable, uh, and back into much more comfortable ground. Um, in the sort of computer vision graphics world largely, and then we'll step back and look at larger data sets and transfer learning uh, coming up, right? So, um, right in, the, in our scheme of things, we were kind of, you know, we started with magnifying glass on one shape, we looked at curvature, all that stuff, we stepped back, looked at the whole shape, and now we're comparing multiple ones, first in a rigid fashion, uh, and then later in a non-rigid fashion, and then finally in a sort of intrinsic, like, computing a map without actually moving one shape on top of the other uh, kind of thing. Right, so that'll be like quadratic assignment problem. Um, and then finally, I think we'll conclude this course by talking about shape collections. Right? So like, I have a whole set of 3D brains and I want to put them all into correspondence at one time and do some statistical analysis kind of stuff. There's some really neat applications there. My goodness, there's a lot of people in and out. Okay. So uh, the last I left you, we briefly skimmed over uh, the beginnings of the ICP uh, algorithm, um, which in addition to being a low quality 90s band, is the, the usual technique that we have uh, for aligning 3D models. Yeah? Uh, and, and so the, the ICP algorithm is sort of one step of a typical uh, pipeline for 3D reconstruction, which just recently has been sort of beginning to be reconsidered in the, in the age of uh, machine learning stuff, but I don't think it's entirely true that this is out of date, that uh, really people have reconsidered individual steps here, but the, the, the individual steps make a lot of sense, right? So um, you have some acquisition device, either this giant geodesic sphere worth of cameras and, and lights and capture devices and all that good stuff. Uh, that gives you a bunch of data, which maybe you have some alignment information because you know where the camera were, cameras were in your scene. Maybe you don't. Um, you solve a registration problem, right? That's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and then finally, you glue together all that data into one uh, mesh. So in this course, we'll focus largely on the registration because that's the sort of shape analysis piece. Um, and then the merging step, um, there's also some pretty cool stuff that happens there too, right? So if you like, go and take Piotr's class on computational geometry and learn a little bit about DLNA triangulation, uh, there's some, some neat algorithms hiding in that world. Yeah? Uh, so last time, we introduced uh, Specifically, this, this ICP technique, right, which is uh, designed to solve this rigid alignment problem. So remember, the, the unknowns in our problem are a rotation and a translation that takes one point cloud onto another. Yeah, and our job is just to like, think of them as big, rigid things uh, that we want to glue together. Uh, we did some degree of freedom counting, and here we are. Right? So here's our, our algorithm in its full glory. You choose your closest match for every point, say, on the green curve. Then you find the rigid motion that aligns uh, those pairs of closest matching points. But the problem, of course, is that those matches might have been bad. Yeah? Uh, and so what do we do? We recompute the closest points and we go again. Incidentally, even before we fill in the details of this algorithm, what are some ways that it could be improved? Like, just roughly, like, what axes could we use to fix ICP? There are many. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about a few today. It's important to be critical about this stuff. Some constraints, sure. Uh, tell me more. What are the constraints on what? Um, for example, you reinforce the adjacent points that you're trying to match to be sort of adjacent points. Ah, that's a fabulous one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if nothing else, writing research papers, right? Because there's like many variations on the theme and you can test them all against each other and they behave well in different uh, scenarios. Um, and indeed, if you were a geometry person in the 90s, you, you would have spent a large part of your time doing that because that's, that's what we did. Uh, but in any event, um, let's fill in some of the details of the, the vanilla ICP technique and then we're going to go through uh, a million different variations of it just so you're aware of the different kind of edges that you could tug on, on this problem. Uh, the reality is that when you're designing your favorite 3D point cloud registration tool, uh, typically you just have to try a few and see what works with your data, right? Like what works with bones and teeth might be very different from what works with non-rigid humans, might be different from a robot scanning a grocery store items or what have you, right? And, and uh, uh, yeah, there, there's no God-given answer here um, because these are all extremely non-convex optimization tools. Cool. Okay, so the one missing piece um, in this, this ICP technique uh, that we talked about, right, the matching part is very easy. Every point just grabs its closest point. For now, you could do that by just iterating over the entire other data set and just computing distances, finding closest. That's yet another thing that could be improved, yeah? Um, and then the other is to solve this optimization problem. We're trying to find a rotation and a translation that minimizes this norm. And you guys, are you able to parse this expression by now? This is saying that I apply my rigid motion, right? I multiply each pi by r and translate by t. Uh, and after I do that, that it wants to match its matched uh, point qi as closely as possible. Right? We, we decided that was called a Procrustes problem. So first of all, this is an optimization problem. I haven't told you how to solve it. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we should spend just a few minutes uh, doing that. And that's where we, we left off last time. Um, right, so uh, because we're grown-ups here, uh, let's make a few definitions. So first of all, we're going to make a matrix P. Right, so this is like P1, P2, and so on. So the columns of P are the data points in one of my point clouds. Okay, uh, and similarly for Q. Right, so this... Uh, Yeah, and so if I want to rotate and translate my entire point cloud all in one shot, how could I do it? Well, I could take uh, P and pre-multiply it by R, right? So this just rotated everything all at the same time. And now I want to add my translation to the whole point cloud. How do I do it? Can I, does this expression parse? No, right? Because this is a vector and this is a matrix. Um, and so there's a good hack that's worth knowing. Is if you have a vector and you want to m copy it a bunch of times, Right, so like, like this is a column and I want a bunch of columns that are all the same. How do I do it? I think I heard. Yeah. So if I multiply that by this vector of all ones transposed, then the thing that will come out is T, 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 T a bunch of times over all the columns of a matrix. Yeah, that's just notation. Cool. And then we want to subtract off from that Q. Remember the Frobenius norm is like the sums of the squares of all of the columns. So this is the same thing. Uh, and we have that I, there's some debate as to whether this should be orthogonal, like a member of O3 or SO3, uh, but we'll, we'll ignore that for now, uh, and, and T. Cool, so this is just a different way of writing our same problem. Cool. Uh, right, so now um, let's, let's basically take this expression and massage it and, and just solve it real quick, yeah? So, first of all, remember, um, there are many, many ways to compute the Frobenius norm of a matrix. Uh, my favorite one for algebra purposes is that the Frobenius norm squared is the same as the trace. Uh, let me make sure if I agree with it, there's a choice to be made here. Um, yeah, uh, the matrix times its transpose. You guys know this identity? This is handy. Cool. All right, so let's apply that here, uh, do a hella algebra, and then get an expression that, that we want. And by the way, um, just for convenience, we're going to assume, without loss of generality, that P times the vector of all ones is equal to the vector of all zeros, right? We can do that just by taking the columns of P and subtracting their average. Remember, we're just trying to find range of motion anyway, so whatever. Cool? Cool. Okay, so let's, uh, let's expand this, this thing. Let's call him star. Yeah. So, what is star really? Well, he is the trace of, this is going to be fun, get, get excited. We have R times P plus T1 transpose minus Q, all of that times the transpose. So this is P transpose R transpose plus T1 transpose minus, ah, oh, I already got it wrong. Sorry. So it'll be 1T transpose 
minus Q transpose. Cool. So all I did was plug into this expression here and transpose. Hopefully everything is, yeah, okay. Cool. So now let's expand the square. Okay, so we have the trace of R, P, P, P transpose R, um, transpose. Uh, then we have, there's actually two times that the same thing appears. I know that matrix multiplication is not commutative, but we, you kind of know when you expand this, if you apply all of your favorite trace identities, that these two things will agree, that this is uh, plus 2 times R, P, 1, T transpose, right? That's this term, minus uh, 2 times R, P, Q transpose, yeah? Uh, now we got the middle term, so this is, I'm really, I'm bored already. This is T, 1 transpose, so it's 1 times T transpose. This is where I went wrong last night when I was doing it, and I had a change of heart about geometry. Uh, minus... 2t1 transpose q transpose plus q q transpose. Did I manage to do that right? Ah. This one? That t? Okay. All right. Um, first of all, why does that not matter? <laughs> what are my unknowns in this problem? R and T. Does this trace term actually depend on R? It, it looks like it does. I see an R here. <laughs> yeah. But remember that trace of A times B is equal to trace of B times A. So I can, I can secretly move that R to the left. And what's R transpose R? Identity. So that term goes away. See, I only make mistakes in places that don't matter. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, now we do the big reveal. Did they use the board underneath? They didn't. Cool. Uh, so, so let's differentiate with respect to t, first of all. Yeah? Um, of, of all that stuff equals zero, right? So we're going to find the translation first, just for fun. Okay, so what is our expression uh, for the gradient with respect to t? So there's no t in the first term. There's one t in the second term. Notice that I can cycle this entire expression around. So this is t transpose to some, times some giant thing. <laughs> Okay, uh, and that whole giant thing is just a vector, so this is just a dot product in disguise. Yeah, so this is really just 2 R P 1. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you guys should catch me because I make a lot of mistakes. Um, okay, what is 1 transpose times 1? 3, yeah, right, because it's, we're in 3D, the vector of all 1's dot product with itself is 3. Yeah? Um, so this is secretly just 3 times the norm of t, so this is that. Cool. Okay. Uh, and now we need to differentiate with respect to this guy, so this is, um, let's see here. So I'm going to cycle this way, so that it's 1 transpose q transpose times t, right? Which means that this is really like that, uh, and that's it. Cool. Okay, first of all, uh, why do you think I subtracted the, the average of all the p's to begin with? Well, now this just goes away. Yeah, so this term is just zero. Oh, because I differentiated with respect to t. Sorry, so this is, yeah, so this is a scalar. I differentiated with respect to t, so I expect there to be a vector. Yeah, and, and that's what we have here. Cool, so now, uh, now we're in good shape, right? Because now we have the uh, t is equal to, um, oh, I made a dumb mistake. I'm sorry. What is 1 transpose times 1? <laughs> it's not 3. It's, it's, it's the number of data points. <laughs> ah, I got the dimension wrong. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's my bad. I'm sorry. So that should be 2. Uh, what's, what number do we want to use for the number of data points? N, sure. And T, that makes more sense. My apologies. Uh, and so then what you get uh, is what you would expect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Whew. That makes more sense. Because what is this thing? Yeah, this is just the average of all the Qs. Do you see that? Okay. 
All right, uh, cool. So now we're taking care of the translation piece of our, our problem. You happy so far? I want to make you happy. Okay, great. Um, so now uh, let's go back to our original problem. We want to optimize respect to R. Yeah, I'm going to try not to obscure this because I know some of you guys are writing. Uh, and let's see what, what terms matter for R. Does this term matter for R? No, we don't have to talk about that. Does this term matter for R? No, because there's a P times 1 hiding in there. That goes away. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, does this term matter for R? Yes. Yeah. Uh, does this guy? No, no, no. So in fact, there's only one term in this entire expression that's needed to optimize for R. This is the piece I was missing when we were at the board the other day. Yeah. Okay, and that is, I wish I were like a little taller. That one. <laughs> okay. So in other words, I claim that I can solve a completely different optimization, well, a very closely related optimization problem for R, yeah? And that is as follows. Okay, so notice there's a minus in front there. So I can instead uh, say that I want R transpose R equals the identity of the trace. I can get rid of that too because it's not going to affect the optimal R of R P Q transpose. That's a trace. That makes sense? So all I did was slice out everything that doesn't involve R and flip them into a max and, well, while changing the size. Okay, so how are we going to solve this problem? Don't all speak at once. Okay, so first of all, what is this thing? Well, remember that secretly this is just the inner product of, of what? This is like R inner product with, you have to be a little careful, Q, P transpose, right? This is like the dot product of two matrices. This is a super simple problem. It's kind of saying find me the rotation matrix which looks the most like this thing in the dot product sense. Yeah, that's all that's going on here. So the simple way to solve this would be take the gradient set it equal to zero and, and sweat a lot. Um, I've already sweat enough for today and in fact there's, there's a headache which is that you have a funny constraint here, right? That R has to be satisfied this, this quadratic relationship. By the way, these constraints define a manifold. Do you guys know that? Like the three-dimensional manifold? Right, so we kind of know that already because rotations are parameterized by roll, pitch, and yaw, right? So that's like three dimensions. So there's a three-dimensional manifold embedded in R9, right? Because these are three by three matrices. Anybody know what that manifold's called? The Stiefel manifold. Yeah, it shows up a lot in computer vision. Okay, uh, right. So let's call P, Q, transpose. So this is just a matrix. It's just a constant in my problem. Yeah, and... It just generically speaking, whenever you have a linear algebra problem and you don't know what to do with it, there's like, uh, there's like three answers to your problem, right? It's like either LU, QR, or SVD. Yeah? Uh, and if you don't know which of those three, you should probably start with the SVD because that tends to solve the most things. So let's do that. Yeah? So let's say, let's, let's take this matrix product. By the way, how big is this matrix? This one is three by three. It had better be or else our whole, there's no order in the universe. Okay, um, so, so let's fa factor this as u sigma v transpose. Cool? Cool, <laughs> I think. Okay, so now um, the trace of R, P, Q transpose, that just by substitution, that's the trace of R, U, sigma v transpose. Let's see if I can do this without looking at my notes. And now we have a trace, so there's only one thing that we can do, which is the, you know, the root hand gesture uh, uh, over there is, is, is suggesting to me, uh, which is to cycle this, this product around. And in particular, I'm, notice that there's like kind of, you know, to use parlance from the Muppets here, like one of these things is not like the other. What are R, U, and V? They're all orthogonal matrices. Yeah, so somehow I just want to isolate that, that sigma. Does that make sense? So I can do that by just scooting this guy over here. Okay, V transpose R U sigma. Cool? <sighs> okay, what is this product if all three of these guys are, are, are in SO3, or in O3, whatever? This thing itself is a rotation matrix, right? This is the product of three of them. Yeah? So let's give that a new name. Let's call that R bar sigma, right? Obviously, if I can optimize for a rotation matrix R bar in this problem, 
then I can solve for r pretty easily. Right? This is a bijection here. Okay, and of course this thing is nothing more than the inner product between sigma and r bar. I was a little sloppy, but sigma is a symmetric matrix, so I can, I can do this. Okay, so what is sigma? The diagonal matrix. Good call. So it's, it's a diagonal, it's got three positive numbers down the diagonal. By the way, this is my own cooked up proof for, for this, this fact. There's a lot of different ways to get there, um, but I like this one because it's mine. Okay, um, so there are three numbers down the diagonal. And so what is going on here? So if, if sigma, really, he looks like sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, then a bunch of zeros. Right? That's what he looks like. So really, this entire sum is kind of like sigma 1 times r bar 1, 1 plus sigma 2 times r bar 2, 2 plus sigma 3 times r bar 3, 3. Right? Everything else in this dot product is zero. Okay. And remember that R is a rotation matrix. So element-wise, what is the biggest value that could possibly be in R? What is the dot product between any two columns of a rotation matrix? It can take on, at most, one of two values. That's a lie. Yeah, no, it's not a lie. One or zero, right? If it's the same column twice, you get a one. If it's two different columns, you get zero. They're orthogonal matrices. So in particular, what does the diagonal of that relationship tell me? What are the norms of the columns of R? Come on, I only ever ask questions where the answer is one or zero. One, yeah? All the columns of R have norm one. Can a vector of norm one have an element that is bigger than one? No. So what is the maximum possible value of this expression? It's just sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 because I know that these three numbers can never be bigger than 1. And how do I achieve that maximum? Yeah, I just take r bar equal to the identity. <laughs> yeah? So that's, that's my proof, that, that r bar has got to equal the identity if I want to solve this optimization. Because remember, I'm trying to maximize. Yeah? So I'll carve out a little box here. <laughs> yeah? So r, oops, that's an r bar is the identity. Remember that we defined r bar to be v transpose times the r we actually wanted times u. You see where we're going with this? So those of you who are used to this expression can, can probably see it by now. v transpose r u. Yeah? So this, for my final trick, says that r is equal to v u transpose. Cool? And that is the solution of the Procrustes problem. What do I do? I subtract the mean from my data, that gives me the translation, and then to get the rotation part, I take this thing, which is like the inner product of the two things after I centered, I take its SVD, and then I just multiply the factors and kind of slice out the sigma. By the way, depending on what textbook you use, the U and V will be flipped, that just has to do with whether you look at PQ transpose or QP transpose. Uh, and, and yeah, and that's what comes out. An extremely simple computation. And by the way, this SVD is cheap. This is three by three. It's not, it's not like some giant numerical linear algebra problem. In fact, there's a formula for it if you want to be fancy. Cool. So at the end of the day, uh, what does this give us? So in the ICP algorithm, what do we do? We compute closest points. Then we take a giant dot product. We do an SVD that you know, aligns our point clouds a little closer, and we iterate. That makes sense? Any questions about the vanilla version of this? I think I managed to get it right. This is, I think this is a first in my academic career. I usually make a sign mistake somewhere in here and then spend like 20 minutes patching it up. Okay, uh, right, and, and, and so that's what we just solved here. So the problem with ICP is that it never actually works. Um, that essentially, this is one of these algorithms that is a local optimization. Remember that like, I'm optimizing for the matching and the rotation and the maximum and the rotation. Every time I do that, the objective value does indeed decrease, um, but it doesn't tell you get a global optimum. Uh, and so, the, indeed, um, there's so many scenarios where ICP just gets stuck. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if your closest point match is just like not a good proxy for the map you were really looking for, then somehow solving for this rigid motion that I'm pointing to but isn't on the screen isn't really going to help you, right? Like you have bad matches that you're trying to align, like, you know, Mazel tov. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of algorithms uh, try to fix it in many uh, different 
fashions. I mean, some obvious ones are here. One is like, well, who's closest points? Like, do I have all of the points on shape A compute their closest points on B? All the points on B compute their closest points on shape A? Maybe I do both. Maybe I randomly select one or the other or whatever. Um, there's how you compute the matching. Like here we just chose closest point, but like if you suggested maybe you do something more complicated, like add bijectivity or smoothness, you could weight it. Like maybe far away points that get matched in your closest point get less weight in front of them. You could reject outliers. You could try different error metrics, right? Like this, this quadratic thing is, is just one notion of error. You could come up with other ones that maybe are more sensitive to outliers or something. All of these are things that people have tried because again, it's easy and this is an easy formula for a research paper. Yeah, um, and because it's important. I don't mean to give my colleagues too much of a hard time, although I'll admit that for a little while we went, we went a little ICP crazy in, in the computer vision community. Uh, so one interesting uh, idea here uh, is illustrated by uh, one basic issue in ICP. Let's say I'm trying to align two uh, planes to one another. <laughs> okay, this is a big problem. Um, because as I, as I slide plans, the plane sort of tangentially, nothing really interesting happens from a, a feature standpoint. Does anybody know what this is called? It was a big buzzword in computer vision for a while. The idea that like, there are certain shapes that you can move them along themselves and nothing interesting happens. Is it the sliding problem? Close. I mean, that's a totally reasonable name for it. Typically, we call this slippage. I don't know which one of these is really the, the word, but, but, but that's the buzzword. And of course, different shapes have different types of slippage. So like a, a cylinder has a one-dimensional slippageness to it. Uh, planes have two-dimensional ones uh, and so on. Um, in fact, there's some interesting intrinsic notions of slippage that I used to study a long time ago. Uh, but in any event, um, Maybe you try to account for the fact that there aren't any interesting features to grab onto in ICP, so your match is likely to be unreliable in these flat regions. So instead, you just look at motion in the tangent plane to your shape. Um, what does that involve? That just involves taking our old error metric, and instead of having distance to your closest point, you sort of dot product with the normal at your closest point, right? Because that's the thing that's measuring motion in the plane. And the rest of the algorithm just carries through. There's some other optimization you have to crank through, uh, but nothing terribly interesting there. Uh, and, and, and for a lot of vision tasks, that's, that's super useful. Um, so the, the typical example that these guys have, um, which I think I have later in the slides, they always have these funny, like, what do you call this? Cuneiform tablets, is that how you say it? Cuneiform? I don't know. Right, where there's like, you know, some random guy and... and like some random Babylonian dude was like keeping track of their cattle and, and they put like little notches on this piece of clay and for some reason you're trying to 3D scan this thing then like uh, you know the problem you're going to have is that like for the most part that clay tablet is one big flat object and then they're like this is these isolated interesting features right these wedges that have some name or another and um, those are the ones you want to pay attention to although the plane sliding along itself is a reasonable uh, match. That makes sense why, because like, think about if my clay tablets are misaligned and shifted from one another, yeah? What are going to be the closest points for all of the flat parts? You're going to be sitting right on top of each other, right? So that ridge of motion isn't going to tell me anything valuable. Um, right, so uh, this is an example of, of sort of a means of thinking uh, that I think is totally obvious. It also goes, not to give your idea a hard time, it also goes back to some of the suggestions we heard here, um, that essentially, rather than just doing closest point, somehow you should really do closest compatible point, right? Like, if my closest point match is green and I'm at an orange point and I have color information, I, I did something wrong, right? Uh, and, and, or, you know, maybe you choose points with similar normals or curvatures or what have you, and each one of these, of course, appears in its own uh, research paper. Uh, another uh, sort of idea that's improved ICP over the years is to change sampling. Right, so in some sense, you could think of the ICP, which actually remember that it's summing over points on, on my domain, but I didn't put any weights in that sum. So it's sort of like using the area measure of the, of the surface. But like I just talked about, there are certain parts of the surface where there are really no interesting features to grab onto. Right? And so one thing you might do is sort of important sample. So in other words, in areas of high curvature, these tend to be things that are easy to align because they kind of click into place. Maybe I put a higher weight on those in my ICP procedure uh, than on the other ones, right? And I can do that by just sampling stuff proportional to curvature instead of just uniformly. Does that make sense? By the way, we're, gonna, we're just going to do a huge grab bag of ICP variants, and you'll see the bottom of most slides except this one because I was rude to my colleagues. I'll have a pointer to the paper that 
gives you details, but I think this is the kind of thing you can see a schematic picture and get the idea. Like, I, I don't see any reason to do all the details. Uh, other techniques look at slippage really explicitly. So one way to do that is you have your point cloud, you, take, you grab a little neighborhood around every point, and you compute the covariance. Right? So remember that's like a proximity of my point cloud with like a Gaussian. So what's going to happen, for instance, if I'm on a plane? What's, what, what, will, uh, what will be the rank of the covariance matrix? Think carefully now. A plane has how many dimensions? Two, so when I try to take a bunch of points on the plane and basically do PCA on them, what, what's going to happen? I get a rank two covariance, yeah? Uh, and, and so one thing to do might be to actually use your covariance as a, a weighting in your, your, your procedure. In other words, motions that leave the plane of the surface are more expensive than motions that stay in the plane. Um, and, and this is kind of interesting because this naturally is feature sensitive. So for instance, here there's sort of a one-dimensional set that if you slide along, nothing interesting happens. So maybe I penalize motion in this direction uh, more than that one by just throwing the covariance into that norm that we're using in the ICP. Yeah? Of course, there's a chicken and egg problem here, right? If this is a noisy object, like somehow, uh, what's the goal of ICP is to take a bunch of scans and align them together so that I reduce noise, right? but I'm relying on the fact that there isn't too much noise to get this covariance, so uh, there, there can be a problem there. Uh, indeed, so here's like a nice uh, image kind of showing roughly the rank of the covariance as they move along the bunny, and you can see, I think the key takeaway from images like that is that close to these features, these are the places that are really helpful for alignment problems, whereas these flat parts are, are less so because of all these slippage issues. And so all of these techniques are basically intended to address that in different ways. Uh, ah, and here's our, our favorite uh, cuneiform, cuneiform, whatever, tablets. Uh, and you can see, indeed, that if I sample based on <laughs> where the normals are changing the most, I get a much better alignment, which isn't terribly surprising. Okay. So this is just a grab bag of, of different ways to make ICP faster. There's about a billion of them out there in the literature. Um, or rather, that, they don't necessarily make ICP faster, but they make it higher quality. Yeah. Um, but let's think computational efficiency for a minute. What do you think is the bottleneck of this algorithm? It's just in terms of CPU time. Where does my, where does my, my CPU take all of its time? I heard like all of the steps in ICP superposed coming at me in one <laughs> giant pressure wave there. Yeah, it's actually finding the closest point. I mean, think about just like in terms of big O, right? So, so when I, how, how long does it take to compute my closest point in the naive fashion? Well, for every point, I have to iterate over all the points on the other guy, compute the distance to each one, and, and, and then find the smallest. Yeah, so that's order n per point, so kind of order n squared, so means both point class are the same size. How long does it take for me to do this thing? Well, this matrix multiply takes n steps, right? Because it's multiplication of two, three by three, three by n matrices. Yeah? And this is 3 by 3 SVD, there's just a formula for it, yeah? Uh, so this is actually pretty fast. It's fast, not very good, but it's fast, yeah? Uh, and, and, and so, of course, a lot of thinking has gone into how to accelerate the, uh, the closest point search in, in ICP as well. Um, those of you who took my undergrad uh, graphics class are, are quite familiar with this, right? Because it's exactly the kind of techniques that we use in ray tracing uh, to make those things faster as well, right? Because you don't want to collide your ray with every possible thing in the scene. Um, so what are the kind of, of data structures that we use for this? You're killing me. I know there's at least, what, I count at least three of you in here. What's that? KD tree, yeah? Yeah, bounding volume hierarchy, that's a good one. The box, yeah, box. Yeah, there are many. Um, uh, so, so one example is a BSP tree. This stands for binary space partition. Yeah? This is a nice simple one. So here's a, a big point cloud, and maybe what I do is I take my point cloud and I find some plane that splits it so that half the points are on the left of the plane, half the points on the right. And so I bin those on the two sides. Yeah? And then I can do that recursively, right? Now I can take the left side and bin, you know, based on some other plane. Notice that there's a degree of freedom here, which is what sort of normal I choose for my plane, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there. When, if you take my undergrad graphics class, we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about different techniques for choosing that plane really carefully, because like, for making video games and doing collision detection, that matters a lot. Here it actually doesn't matter quite so much, because you, you're, you don't really know where in your point cloud you're going to do your, your closest point query, um, and that changes depending on where you are in ICP. 
Uh, and so of course the, there's some clever strategy. So let's say I want to find the closest point to this red guy. What could I do? Well, you know, he's on the left of this plane, so I go over here. Now I notice he's above the next plane, so I go up, and there's his closest plane. Does that algorithm always work? That's a, that's a log n technique, yeah? Every time I chop my data set in half. You're all nodding, but you're all wrong, right? This is a terrible algorithm, yeah? Like what if I'm at this point right here? <laughs> What's going to happen? Well, my closest point is actually on the other side of the plane, but I'm not going to see it because I threw it away. <laughs> yeah? And so actually this technique, you have to be extremely careful uh, to be conservative because otherwise uh, that's the match you're going to get and that would be, that would be bad news. Yeah? Uh, and, and so the reality when you implement techniques to make sure you get the correct match, you have to be quite conservative in the way that you do it. So what you do is you lower bound, or you lower bound the distance to the plane that divides the two sets. And if you can show that that lower bound of distance, in other words, the closest possible point in that entire partition is farther away than the closest estimate I have, then I don't recurse. But there are some cases where I have to look on both sides of the tree. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is a good gotcha. Uh, and of course there are many versions of this, so I think some of you guys um, mentioned a KD tree. Uh, and that's just a, a special case where the, the planes that you choose are axis aligned. But it makes for nice looking pictures, yeah. Um, I was in Russia recently and they were talking about Kade trees and I, I didn't know what they were talking about. Anyway, um, okay, uh, right, so uh, speed aside, uh, I, I think like I've, I've already told you in 50 ways per Sunday, um, ICP is often uh, unsuccessful and there are many really clever visualizations of that. Um, so one um, that I really like uh, is shown here. This is a little hard to read if you're not used to it, but I think it's really, it's really neat. I, th I think this is from Nealer Mitra, and he deserves a lot of credit for coming up with this. So here's the plane. Cool. Cool. And there are a bunch of circles on the plane. And these are like S1, so these are like the angles between 0 and 360. And for every point in every circle, this corresponds to taking, you might see a little bunny here. So I take the bunny, I translate him to that point, and then I rotate it so that his tuchus is aligned with that point on the on the circle. Does that make sense? So for every one of these different translation rotation pairs, I run ICP, right? So that takes the bunny and it tries to put him back. And sometimes it gives me the global optimum and sometimes it doesn't. And so the, the way to read these plots is we're going to put little pie charts on every one of these circles that tells me where it converged and where it didn't. Like where did ICP uh, give me a successful answer? Yeah? Did everybody get the, the way we're going to read this? What do you think it's going to look like for, for vanilla ICP? Yeah, thumbs down. Yeah, uh, and that's roughly right. So, but, but there's actually a nice pattern to it, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so remember that uh, black means good, white means bad. Okay? What is this plot telling me? It's telling me as long as like, the butt of my bunny is facing to the right, ICP does okay. That's kind of a reasonable takeaway. Right? Because remember, how do we compute translation? Somehow translation gets killed in one step in this algorithm, right? Because you just subtract off the mean and now you're done with uh, translation. All you're left with is that rotational part. Yeah? That's not going to be true for some of the other variants, but in, in this one it is. Uh, okay, and so what is this saying is roughly after you translate, if you're co-aligned, then it's successful. Okay? What's the other takeaway? As a fraction of like the number of experiments where ICP was successful, notice that that is less than 50%. And this is in the simplest possible case, right? We've only rotated one angle, like, and the other two are, are correct. Yeah? Uh, there are many other metrics. Uh, so for instance, we talked about that point-to-plane one to account for slippage. Uh, the bunny, that one does okay, right? Because the bunny's pretty curved. Um, now the, conver the convergence gets... I think this is much harder to interpret. Apparently there are a lot of local optima, right? Like if you look here, somehow sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, and so anyway, these are, in fact, just this morning we were chatting about some ICP techniques. I think this is a clever way to visualize about, uh, like sort of what the behavior is. Because somehow there's just like a thumbs up, thumbs down, was I successful or not? And so this is a very fast way to look and see like, did this, this tool work? Yeah? Okay. So that kind of concludes our, our, our basic understanding of ICP, right? These are all the things you could do with two bunnies and complete information. Of course, it's not a very realistic scenario to be in, even with the bunny, right? I mean, he's got to sit on a table and, and, and we're never going to see his, 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 his bottom side, which is actually geometrically useful. You know, the bunny has a little indentation on the bottom. Fun fact. Um, so, one way to understand what can go wrong, let's say I have three different scans of the bunny, maybe they're all complete, I make my life a little better. 
right? And I register scan A to scan B, scan B to scan C, and then scan C to scan A. So I have three rigid motions. In an ideal world, if I compose those three things, what should I get? The identity, right? Because I just went back to the frame of the first guy. Given these plots I was just showing you, where like the, the regime where ICP is successful, and remember that like somehow for those three things to all work out, that's like three different runs of ICP that all have to be successful. How often do you think that works? Not very, yeah. And, and, and so this is a, a very typical issue. It comes up time and time again. Uh, right? uh, people talk about it as putting things in a common coordinate system. These days, because of GANs, now we talk about it as cycle consistency. But these are all the same issue, which is that I have some pairwise thing. And essentially, I keep registering pairwise. There's no guarantee on that algorithm that it knows anything about the whole collection at once. At the same time, if I know the whole collection, I might as well register them all in one shot instead of doing this pairwise procedure, and that can improve the quality, right? Because it could be that like bunnies A, B, and C all have pretty good butts, but their heads are messed up, and vice versa for D, E, F, and then maybe bunny G is like a full scan, so I can align them all to G, and then they all come, you know, go together. But I can only do that if I have my whole data set in one shot, rather than just doing everything pairwise. Does that make sense? So there's actually some hope here. Uh, and, and Indeed, that's a good thing. So here, for instance, um, <laughs> you know, there's a very simple experiment. So we took a bunch of copies of the same circular arc and registered them. Like, so I took the first guy, registered to the second, took that, registered to the third, and then, of course, that's the thing you get. By the way, the ground truth here, this image is suggestive of the wrong answer, which would be a circle. The ground truth really is just an arc, by the way. We're like nowhere close to what you should get. Right? These are all copies of the same shape. Okay. Um, right. Random initialization is one of many techniques to make ICP better. Yeah, does it, actually it does absolutely. Um, like for instance, uh, in this diagram here, if you just keep flipping a coin with your rotation, you know, like what, at least twenty-five percent of the time, you'll get the right answer. Well, there's a problem, is that it exponentiates, right? If you have a bunch of shapes and you have random initialization, you have to do that for all of them at once. Uh, so the probability of, of all of the, the stars aligning uh, uh, decreases. Right, so this is this idea, um, I always could be, it's not SLAM, it's the other popular algorithm in vision. <laughs> um, RANSAC, thank you. Right, RANSAC stands for random sample consensus, so maybe you randomly draw one of these guys and align him to all the other ones or something like that. Uh, and indeed, there's some statistical guarantees on, on behavior of that. So I'm not an expert, but, but there are, there, yeah, there, there is some, some hope there. But it's not obvious how to do that, right? If you, if you just randomly keep randomly drawing initial guesses, uh, I think the, the likelihood that they all kind of agree is going to very much decrease the size of your data set. So like Ransack is, Ransack is like one clever way to kind of choose one frame of reference carefully and then randomly align everything else to it. Uh, and so that's how they kind of cope with dimensionality. I'm sure someone out there has done Ransack for ICP, but I, I, don't, I don't know it offhand. Because yeah. um, if nothing else, historically, it's like the same group of people, right? Like Neil, I worked a lot on both of them. Okay, um, so there are many different ways to, to deal with, with collections, this, this being among them. Uh, some of the simple ones, maybe you choose an anchor scan, so you say like, this particular bunny seems to be pretty noise free, so I'm just going to align everything to him. Uh, it, it, maybe you do something funny like, first I align bunny one and bunny two, and then I glue them together into one, hopefully improved bunny point cloud, and then I take bunny three and align it to that glued together guy. Right, so sort of an agglomerative process. Maybe you, or maybe you try, you take that old ICP objective function, and you just sum it over all pairs of shapes, and you try to optimize in some crazy way. Right? These are all uh, different things people have done. Uh, one kind of interesting one is to build a graph over the set of scans. So maybe you notice that like certain pairs of bunnies seem to align quite easily. Right? So you might as well align those pairs with one another. And this is not necessarily a reflexive relationship or, or whatever. It can, is it reflexive? Like, it might be that scan 1 aligns well to scan 3, but sc and scan 4 aligns well to scan 3, but scan 1 does not align well to scan 4. Whew, I got that right. So I build this big graph, and then for every edge I have some rigid motion, and then I want to kind of correct inside of that graph. And we'll talk about one technique for doing that. Uh, and so, for instance, um, one of the really famous ones by Lou and Milius is uh, 
you do sort of a pairwise ICP, maybe you throw away edges where ICP wasn't successful, which you know, by the way, right? There's an objective value, which is big uh, when, when it failed. Yeah? Uh, and then you do some other kind of least squares problem to average together the, the different rotations. Um, one of the big challenges there, of course, is averaging rotations and uh, averaging rigid motions is not a well posed problem, uh, and often you can end up with something worse than what you started with. Um, but um, these global uh, registration things can, can help sometimes, so here's like a nice example. Now I thought for fun we'd step sideways and talk about one scenario in which uh, this sort of global registration picture makes a lot of sense, but we have to throw away a lot of structure uh, for it to make sense. Uh, and, and we'll see that actually lifting to the uh, general case of ICP is, is largely an open problem. Um, so remember at the beginning of class last time we motivated a problem in cryo-electron microscopy? Right? This was this idea that I have a bunch of scans of a molecule basically from different camera angles and I'm trying to put them all in one common coordinate frame. Yeah? Uh, and so between any two molecular scans, a very, very, very coarse notion of what's going on is that maybe between two images, by like choosing feature points, or there's a clever idea called common lines, you can find some estimate of the rotation between any two frames. Yeah? This is just like ICP, right? Between any two bunnies, I can come up with some estimate of the rigid motion from one into the next. The problem is that the SNR is extremely low, right? That the signal uh, there is, is, is often almost not present. Yeah? And so, um, one uh, sort of the general version of this ICP problem is something called a synchronization problem. And that makes a lot of sense, right? So in other words, between every pair of bunnies, I have some rotation, but the problem is that they don't agree, and now I'm trying to synchronize them all into one consistent set of, of, of rotational frames. Does everybody get the setup here? So now let's throw away all the interesting parts and do a much simpler version of this to suggest some of the sort of cutting edge of, of algorithms in this, which are extremely slow but fun to look at mathematically. Okay, so um, rather than talking about synchronization on SE3, do you guys know what SE3 stands for? It's the space of rotations and translations. Right? So one way to describe what I've told you about so far is I do ICP pairwise and I want to fix it, and then I need to do synchronization on SE3. You can use that phrase at, you know, at a bar and, and impress your friends. Um, synchronization on SE3, if you want to continue to use phrases at a bar to impress your friends, is a really difficult problem because SE3 is a non-compact group. Uh, but we're going to throw all that information away and do a much simpler case which is something called angular synchronization. So this is, I have a bunch of one-dimensional signals, so maybe, you know, there's some function that I observe, for whatever reason, on a line, you know, so there's a function. Yeah, and I observe a bunch of copies of it. But every time I observe it, maybe it's like shifted some unknown amount, right? And maybe here it's even like that, right? So it's a bunch of copies of the same signal, but every time they can be rotated to some unknown quantity. That makes sense? Now obviously if I draw it like this, it's pretty easy to solve synchronization problem. Right? You, you choose one of these guys, just align everything to it. Yeah? But the reality is that usually you have a heck of a lot of noise happening here. Incidentally, this is a reasonable problem in signal processing, right? There are some cases, like maybe everybody does have a 24-hour cycle, but like because of the way that the time of day works, they're all shifted from one another, and so the signals that you get are all cyclical and, and permuted in, in different ways. This is a made-up problem, but uh, it's actually sort of a, a great example of, of the simplest possible case. Because hopefully you can see that between any pair of these, it's not so hard to get a reasonable estimate of the rotation of one onto the other, right, just by trying all the possible rotations, taking the dot product and finding the one with the biggest dot product. But that procedure will not be cyclically consistent. Everybody get the setup? There's also a second thing that's worth noting about this setup. Is there a God-given rotation angle that I should apply to all of these so that they align? In other words, like I rotate this by pi over 2, and this by pi over 3, and this by pi over 7, and then they're all going to be in the same place. The answer is yes, that is a solution to the problem, but then if I took all of them and rotated them by the same angle, you'd be equally happy. Does that make sense? So I'm going to put them all in the same reference frame, but what that frame is, is actually itself a variable. Does that make sense? So this, this appears, for example, in the ICP case, when I co-line all of my bunnies, if I put them all in the same co-line frame and then I rotated that whole thing, I would still be kind of happy because they're still aligned. But this is a problem from an optimization perspective because my output is extremely non-unique. Right? It's all of these things modulo, uh, adding a constant to all of these angles at the same time. 
Okay, so hopefully we get the setup and why this is a big pain. And notice that this is a sub problem of the SE3 synchronization. Right? This would be like all of your bunnies happen to be sitting with the same center of mass and only rotated about one axis. We see it's already hard. Okay, in fact, it's not just hard, it's NP hard. Okay, uh, but in any event, Let's solve it, because this one actually is kind of practically solvable um, using two different techniques. I've given you a reference from 2010 that was pretty well uh, cited, uh, and is I think actually really the standard for what people do uh, when they're in this scenario. Conveniently, it was also written by my postdoc supervisor, so I was paid, you know, lots of money to understand what goes on inside of these papers. Okay, so the basic idea here is that the thing that I can estimate, like if I think of taking these signals and rotating them, right? When I say rotate, what I mean is like cyclically permuting. Hopefully that makes sense. What I can estimate isn't just the theta i, because that's only known up to global shift. What I really can estimate is a difference, right? For every pair of signals, I can estimate some number delta i j, which is some approximation of theta i minus theta j. In other words, the difference in shifts that you would need to put one guy into the other guy's frame. That makes sense? Cool. And the problem is that these things aren't consistent, right? So if I go, if I do theta 1 minus theta 2 plus theta 2 minus theta 3 plus theta 3 minus theta 1, or like uh, by adding together these delta differences here, I likely will not get a multiple of 2 pi. Okay. So how are we going to solve this? And by the way, this is That's the most algebra we'll do in this class. Okay. Um, so first of all, this 2 pi ambiguity is kind of annoying, right? Like if I rotate my entire signal 360 degrees, nothing changed. And that actually has nothing to do with my synchronization problem at all. That's a clever way to, to get rid of at least that issue. I have two different angles, and I want to know if they're the same angle up to 2 pi. I'll wait. I won't wait. I can't. You guys are killing me. So what happens if I take two angles that are the same as 2 pi and I take the cosine? You get the same number. What about if I have two angles that are the same as 2 pi and I take the sine? What about if I take cosine plus i times sine? They're the same. What if they're different? Will I get the same number? No. So definitely, yeah. So, so a, a different way of putting that is that e to the i delta i j is approximately e to the i theta minus, right? And now at least I've gotten rid of that mod two pi. <sighs> Y'all are killing me. Okay. Uh, so uh, in other words, I can view my optimization problem as really I'm trying to compute a bunch of complex numbers z i, which are equal to i e to the i. I know, I know that there's a little bit of, of clash in notation, but I think it's pretty easy to disambiguate. I'm doing this to follow the, the original paper here. Okay. Everybody with me so far? <sighs> okay. So what are we given as input, and what are we trying to output? As input, we're given delta ij. Yeah? By the way, for fun, let's write um, hij is equal to e to the i delta ij just because we're going to do everything in complex numbers. That's our input, and our output is a bunch of zi's, which are unit complex numbers, because that's exactly the same as encoding an angle. Are you with me? If you're, if you're not, you should say so. You guys are like even lower energy than you normally are. There you go. Uh, that a different way to encode an angle is as a unit complex number. And the nice thing is that, that gets rid of this 2 pi ambiguity. Cool. Great question. Okay. Um, Right, so if, if, if I have this expression here, there's a different way of writing it, which is, remember that this is secretly zi times zj conjugate, <laughs> yeah? Um, okay, so, so a different way of writing this expression is that zi minus e to the i delta ij zj is roughly equal to zero, yeah? Does that make sense? Oops, and I guess... Uh, this is HIJ. This kind of makes sense, right? Like, so it's like saying, take one signal, apply the thing that rotates it into the other signal, and what you get is the other guy's rotation. Okay. 
So again, our inputs are the H's, our outputs are the Z's. But there's a bunch of constraints, namely that the Z's have to be unit length. Okay. Cool. So, in the absence of a smarter idea, what do we do? We solve least squares, yeah? So let's do that. So in particular, I have a bunch of these delta ij's, and I'd like to um, agree with them as, as much as I can. So, so one way to do that uh, would be as follows. I'm going to sum over all the ij pairs. Right? By the way, there's a slightly more general version of this where hij occasionally is zero, which indicates that like, there's just no observation, but the, but the math isn't any harder. Okay, and I can look at the following quantity, which is zi conjugate hij zj. Okay, so remember that, what is zi conjugate? This is e to the minus i times theta i, right? So zi conjugate times zj is e to the i theta j minus theta i, right? So this is like saying, I go from i to j, I go from j to i, then I should get the identity. Right, so this is a least squares problem. In an ideal world, if there exists a globally perfect solution, what would be the optimal objective value for my problem? Zero, right? Because I can just cancel all this stuff out with the z's. Um, but otherwise, it might not be. Okay, so what are we going to do? Uh, well, we only know how to do one thing in this class, which is expand the square. So let's do that. Now, this is the complex absolute value, so we're going to be a little bit uh, careful, right? So this is like... Um, z i bar h i j z j minus 1, and then you have to multiply by its conjugate, right, to get the norm square. So this is z i h i j conjugate z j minus 1 bar. Whew. Okay, uh, and let's expand the, uh, the square here. So first of all, if I have z i bar times h i j times z j times z i not bar h i j bar z j bar, <laughs> I know that was a lot of letters, but you can also just read it. Yeah. First of all, what is z i bar times z i? It's the norm of z i. What is z i? One. What is z j bar times z j? And what's h i j bar times h i j bar? It times h i j. One. Okay. This is just a complicated expression for one. <laughs> okay? Then we have uh, the cross term, which is going to be this guy plus its conjugate, or, uh, yeah, plus its conjugate, I guess what, minus it? Yeah? What is a number plus its conjugate? It's two times the real part, right? Because it's like a plus i times b, and then a minus i times b, so I add those together. Yeah? So this is minus two times the real part of z i h i j z j cool huh uh plus what's minus one squared one. thank you somebody okay so really uh what, what is my optimization problem well one way to understand it is as follows what i'd like to do so this is a constant this is a constant there's a minus here so when i'm trying to minimize the least squares problem i can instead maximize the sum over ij of the real part, typically, I think in the, the original paper, they just leave this real part out. You can convince yourself you don't need it, but whatever. If you implement this in CVX, you do need it. CVX will get annoyed because there's a data type issue. Um, by the way, this too <laughs> is hiding inside of that SIGGRAPH paper I sent you guys, which somehow is using the union of all things in this class. Um, okay. Uh, and what are my, so this is an optimization problem over all the zi's, right? What constraints do I have on my problem? Does any zi work? No. Yeah, the norm of zi. What is norm of zi? What? For all i. Right? This is like saying this is a complicated way of encoding an angle. Yeah? First of all, how easy it to, is it to solve the problem I've written you here? I have a quadratic objective. I have, I mean, I can square this if I want. I have quadratic constraints. This is a hard problem. Um, and the reason is that this is the product of a bunch of circles. If I only had one circular constraint, this would be an eigenvalue problem. But I got a bunch. I got one for every single i. Right? And that's what makes this problem hard. Yep. 
Okay. This is like one of these problems that I think is like hard in the worst case, but actually not so bad in, in practice. Uh, okay. So now, there's actually two different relaxations of this problem that people use in practice. Uh, one of which uh, is a semi-definite program, the other is the eigenvalue problem. Yep. So let's do the eigen one first. So, the eigenvalue relaxation of this problem is uh, super nice. Wow, that's even worse handwriting than normal. Um, if all of the zi's have absolute value 1, and I sum over all i mod zi squared, what do I get? n, yeah? So a relaxation, by the way, when I use the term relaxation, do you guys know what I mean? It means take an optimization problem and remove some constraints. So do I necessarily solve the original problem? No, but oftentimes I can get close. By the way, if I relax this problem, will my objective value get bigger or smaller? Bigger, bigger right? Because I removed constraints from my problem. So there are more z's that I can put in than I could before. Yeah? So uh, here, um, I could uh, solve exactly the same objective, right? Uh, uh, z i bar h i j z j such that and now if I like think of sticking all of these z's into one long vector then I could constrain this term to be n notice this is a relaxation right this certainly satisfies that but not everything that satisfies this satisfies that but what is this problem we know from lecture two of this course, this is an eigenvalue problem, right? There's one quadratic constraint, there's a quadratic objective. And so in effect, all I'm asking you to do is compute the dominant eigenvector of H in the complex sense. You've got to deal with, with real complex parts here. And so what do you do in practice? You get some long vector of Z's, and uh, you divide them by their norms, and out comes uh, 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 the solution to your synchronization problem. And you can show with high probability that this is within a constant of the, the optimal value. Um, we're not going to prove that here because that's hard. <laughs> okay. Um, why is that handy? Uh, well, for one thing, um, by the way, remember I, we talked about there's this ambiguity. Like if I took all of my circles and I rotated them by the same angle, that I would get the same thing. Notice that that's hiding here. Because if I rotate everything by the same angle, it's like multiplying all the z's by the same unit complex number. But then I multiply again by its conjugate. And this is just a tr uh, fact about... I can value problems in the complex numbers that if I rotate by a complex value, nothing changes. So this is one relaxation of the problem, but it's extremely loose, right? I mean, this is, this is a big relaxation of that constraint. There's another one. Um, this is the semi-definite program relaxation. This is all the rage in applied math right now. Um, it's okay if I erase this. I just noticed I violated the blackboard topology and wrote on the one that doesn't slide. But I'd like to keep that there. Okay. Um, Because the name of the game, when you cook up these, um, these relaxations, is you would like to remove as few constraints as possible, right? Because that's going to keep you kind of as close as possible to the original problem. Okay? So, let's uh, define a, a matrix, as we like to do. Um, so, so what's in the objective here? Notice it's zi conjugate times zj. So let's define a vector, which is like z1, z2 and so on, all in one big thing, so that's our unknown, is this guy. I'm going to define a big Z, which is going to be the outer product of this thing in itself. So we're going to do Z conjugate transpose, oh, oops, Z conjugate times Z transpose. Notice the element IJ of this thing is exactly the term IJ in this objective here. So now I can write my optimization problem in kind of an interesting fashion, right? I can say uh, the following, which is the real part of the trace of H, uh, I guess, transpose times big Z here, right? This is just fancy notation for what was, what's, what's up there, yeah? Um, and now I need a bunch of constraints. One of them could be uh, as follows, which is that this is little z, z transpose of the bar over there. Cool. If I add constraints to this problem, so long as they're satisfied by z, I'm like nothing changed. Does that make sense? I can add redundant constraints, that doesn't hurt anything. So, so in particular, um, 
I could add the constraint that z is rank 1. When we talk about complex rank, we don't typically care about the, the, the conjugate part. Um, okay. Uh, what else do we know about z? We know that the diagonal of z is 1. That's absolutely brilliant. Because what is the diagonal of z? It's the norms of the zi's, right? It's like zi conjugate times zi. Like that. We know that z is symmetric, but we also know one additional thing. Let's say I take a complex vector and I do v conjugate transpose times z times v again. I get a positive real number. Yeah, z is positive, semi-definite, which is this symbol that I can never draw on the board. Uh, this thing. Okay, cool. And I claim, by the way, does, does little z appear anywhere in this problem except in this constraint? No, so I can actually just get rid of the first constraint. Do you see that? Because the rank 1 says that implicitly any z that satisfies these constraints could be factored this way. That's what rank 1 means. So why would I do this? Somehow I've made my problem worse, right? I started with a vector and now I have a matrix worth of unknowns. And I've convinced myself this is the same as the original problem. There's only one issue, which is Oh, well, this problem's a big pain in the, 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 the behind to, to solve. And why is that? Well, the objective function is linear. That's not so bad, right? Well, that's convex. Constraint 3 is convex, right? The set of semi-definite matrices is convex. If I add two of them together and divide by two, I get another semi-definite matrix. That makes sense, right? Because if I have A transpose times M1 times A, and that's a positive number, then I have A transpose times M2 times A, that's a positive number if I add those two together. Can I get another positive thing? Okay, so that's all right. This is a convex constraint. In fact, it's just fake, removing some values. What about this guy? This is some weird variety in Rn by n. This is an extremely difficult set to work with. Yeah, The set of rank 1 matrices in the set of all matrices. It's some weird algebraic set. So what do you think I'm going to do? Remove it, because I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah, uh, and uh, then we can solve, now this is a convex optimization, I can solve it for global, globally optimal z. It turns out, and I'll let you guys do this on your scratch paper, that this is a relaxation of that. In other words, this one is stronger. And then what do I get? I get a matrix z, and from that I compute its SVD. If I'm really lucky, it's rank 1, and I get those z's. Otherwise, I compute the dominant eigenvector, and, and life is good. So this is called the semi-definite relaxation of this synchronization problem. Does that make sense? You should have questions, because that's an extremely fuzzy explanation of what's going on. What are the consequences? What are the consequences? That's a great question. So at the end of the day, what I get out is a matrix of Z. And if I'm lucky, Z is rank 1. Yeah. And if z is rank 1, then what it says is that I dropped this constraint, but I satisfied it anyway. Uh, and so somehow life is good, and, and I, I got the global optimum of my original synchronization problem. What if z is rank 2? What can I say? A priori, absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah? So there's this kind of funny thing that happens. I run this, occasionally I get a rank 1 matrix, life is good. Sometimes I get a rank 2 matrix, and then I say, eh. Um, in practice, what do people do? They take, compute the dominant eigenvector, and they use that. Um, but there's no guarantee why that has to work. Of course, that's a total lie. Uh, there's a lot of theory sitting underneath this that says why this should work. Um, let me draw you a schematic in 10 seconds or less that, that explains it. This, by the way, is the topic of like multiple courses in the math department we're doing in about five minutes. Okay? Um, but this is how you, I think one thing that's lost a lot, like deriving STP relaxations is really easy. The hard part is showing that it's useful. But if you're like me, you just throw it into CVX and try it, and then a posteriori, like, come up with some schematic why. Um, okay. So notice that uh, our optimization problem takes a very particular form, which is, in some sense, we're doing what? We have some linear objective. Let's say that we're just in the linear algebra case. So our, our unknown is some x. And our objective is some linear thing in, our, in, in, in x. And then I have, my original problem is that x is in some crazy set s. I don't know what that set is. It's some crazy set. In this case, it's a set of rank 1 matrices that satisfy a lot of constraints. Yeah? Let's draw a schematic of what that looks like. Here's S. I guess I could have made it an actual S. So that probably would have been a better. Like, here's, here's, here's S, which happens to be a useful non-convex problem. Yeah? And now, what is the gradient of my objective in this, in this problem? It's really simple. It's a constant. It's C. 
Yeah? So what is C? It's like an arrow that's just like thinning on top of my, my set S. Right, this is S. Okay, I'll erase this because it's confusing. Um, so I have some crazy set, and there's just some arrow sitting on top of it, which is the gradient of my objective. And what is the goal? What is the goal of this problem? Like, in life, what is this trying to do? It's trying to move to the right as far as it can. You see, that? that's, that's the schematic you should have in mind when you have a linear objective function. There's just some arrow sitting on top of your problem, and you're trying to find the feasible point in S. This is S. That's the farthest along C. That makes sense? So what is that point in this picture? I'm going to interpret the hand gestures you guys just made as this point. <laughs> cool? What's special about this point? It's extremal, uh, and in particular, I mean, it's sort of extremal because like, it's the max, yeah? Um, but what's extreme about it? Geometrically, what would be the term you would use? Can it ever, no matter what choice of C, can it ever be that the optimum is this point unless something really special happens? No. This is absolutely true. So if you look at C, C is normal to the, 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 the surface of my constraints. Because right? otherwise, like if it were over here, I could kind of slide along the, the constraint surface and get a better point. Anything else special? That could be. Anything else special about this picture? <laughs> Thank you. It is on the convex hull of this shape. So the convex hull is the smallest shape that is convex and encloses this one. Ooh, I have yellow. That's not yellow. Um, which is like this, right? So this is the smallest convex shape that oops, in, in includes uh, my constraint set. Can it ever be the case that I'm inside of the convex hull when I solve this problem? No, because I can always find something farther away uh, that solves this. In other words, if I can, I can take any problem with a linear objective and I can replace x and s with x is in the convex hull of s, and there exists a feasible point for this problem with the extremal objective value that I want um, that gives me the solution that I want. Yes? Can you have like an unstable... That's a great question. So. What did this picture assume? I'm like destroying the projector right now, I apologize. It proved, it assumed that this solution was unique. Yeah? So let's say that my constraints set were like the letter C instead of the letter S. And my objective pointed this way. Now I can beat the convex hull, I could easily get a point here. And that wouldn't be so great. Yeah. Um, so there's a, nice, uh, there's a nice little theorem hiding here which is extremely easy to prove, which is any time I have a linear objective, the solution to my original problem lies on the convex hull of the constraints set. Uh, and notice this problem, the way I've written it down, this is a convex problem in kind of a lame fashion. Yeah? Um, but I could be in this scenario where the solution is no longer unique and I actually like, I run interior point method. Interior point tends to be kind of annoying in this, in this scenario. It's going to be exactly the middle of all the points I care about. So there's actually only two things that can go wrong in these convex relaxation. One is that when I drop this constraint, I, the set that I'm left with is bigger than the convex hull of the constraints. The other is that there's some symmetry in my problem that I missed, uh, and that when I solve it, I get something right in the middle of the symmetry. Yeah? So in this case, one thing you can show, what do you think is the convex hull of the, the rank one semi-definite matrices? Well, if I average two rank one things together, generically, what do I get? Like a rank two matrix, yeah? If I average two rank two things together, I get rank four. Right, so, so the, the best thing I can hope for is, is the, the convex hull of the rank one uh, semi-definite matrices is just the set of semi-definite matrices. Uh, and so you can show that, that for this problem, this is pretty close to the convex hull of the constraints, which is why this isn't just like dropping a constraint and then like doing your rosary and, and praying that you, you get the, the right answer. In fact, uh, you sort of dropped the minimal number of things that you need uh, to get a convex problem, which is pretty close to the schematic that we've drawn here. Yeah. Um, by the way, when you look at the theory, 
attached to this area of, of research, really it just involves filling in this, this diagram, right? So people in this area go to a lot of work to show that I kind of, I mean, what, what were the meta steps that I did here? I took my problem and I rewrote it in a way where the objective was linear. Right? We started with one that was quadratic, by the way. That probably slipped past. And then after I did that, I then dropped the minimal number of constraints I needed to make my problem look nice. And then uh, we were all set. Yeah, uh, and, and, and so that last step of checking that my relaxed problem is the convex hull of the original one is typically very hard, and there are only some very uh, specific scenarios where, where you get lucky. Um, cool. So, first of all, uh, what if we wanted to do synchronization on SO3? Like I have rotation matrices on R3 as opposed to R2. There's actually some reasonable ways that you can do that, right? So now, um, it's not so clear, I don't have angles anymore. But one thing that's at least invariant to that 2 pi issue would be to have a bunch of 3 by 3 matrices that I'm trying to synchronize, right? Like rotation matrices. And I could make those into a 3 by 3n vector, as it were, vector-ish object. If I take the outer product of that guy in itself, what do I get? I still get a semi-definite matrix. And now it has 3 by 3 blocks down the diagonal, which are little identity matrices. And that's sort of the beginning of, of a convex relaxation of that problem. Then in SE3, where I just add this one additional kind of innocent looking thing, which is translation, then what do I do? Then it's actually unsolved. So there's actually, it's, I, I think it's open how to do this in a convex fashion. Um, there's some interesting things that try to projectivize the SE3 into a sphere. Um, these are a little fishy. Uh, uh, they're not fishy, I mean, they're perfectly mathematically fine. I mean, I hope you're not watching this. And, uh, but but there's, a, there's a lot more to be done uh, there, because synchronization on, on non-compact space is weird. Somehow, the reason this diagram works is because this diagram is bounded. <laughs> yeah. But SE3 has translation. Translation can be anything. It can be any bi arbitrarily big number. Uh, and that sort of gets in the way of this nice convex hole picture here. This is a very schematic way of drawing a very serious branch of mathematical research. OK. So as a very last uh, topic, I've managed to now make our class one lecture behind where it should be. Um, Let's really quickly sketch out some non-rigid registration stuff. These are incredibly important. They tend to be quite heuristic in nature. So non-rigid registration is exactly what it sounds like. So I have like, somebody deforming in front of a camera when I register. Now we're going away from scary math land and back into extremely heuristic, elastic, whatever land. Um, so non-rigid registration says that as I solve ICP, maybe I'm happy to take my point sets themselves and de just deform them a little bit as I align. That makes a lot of sense. Um, there are a lot of different scenarios for this, right? Like one is tracking somebody as they talk in front of a camera. Um, another kind of interesting one, does anybody know how the Invisalign retainers work? No? Anybody know this was an early application of ICP? Uh, so what you do, you bite into the plaster mold and then you mail it off to this company. Your orthodontist does very little here, um, but they make a lot of money. Uh, you, you bite into the plaster mold, you send it to this company, and they actually put it into a laser scanner and they scan your, the 3D positions of your teeth, which conveniently are rigid objects. So uh, teeth are, are easy to work with uh, geometrically. Uh, and then they compute the geodesic between your teeth as they currently are and the platonic <laughs> ideal of your, your mouth. And then they print a series of retainers and they mail that back to the orthodontist and that's, that's what you use. That's a great uh, example where rigid registration is not enough because each tooth moves independently. Yeah, uh, and so it could be like, you know, we're trying to correct our teeth. I, I, you go into your orthodontist to check in and you want to know alignment to the retainer that you're going to get next. You can't just solve a rigid problem because one tooth might be out of place. Uh, and, and so that's a, a good example of, of a very slightly non-rigid problem. And then a more non-rigid problem would be like you have skin that's moving around as you, as you talk, just like that. Um, and of course, there, there are many different problems um, when you do this kind of stuff, right? I, uh, you know, there's noisy data, there's holes in your acquisition, you don't have a correspondence, and now we're going to throw into the mix deformation. And if you have the most generic deformation, then ICP is very easy. You just like crumple up your shape and you smash it on the other one and you're, you're done, right? So obviously there, there, there's more to be done there. Um, so in our slides, I know we're basically out of time, but I, I outline really quickly um, one popular technique. Uh, this is actually out of date now. It's all the way from, oh God, almost a decade ago, more than a decade ago. Ha! Uh, uh, for for non-rigid registration, um, where essentially they cycle through a bunch of different steps to avoid all of these different issues. This is one of the top performing ones in practice, although I think it's been replaced very recently with some, some deep learning techniques, of course. 
And um, right, so the, here is a, a, a very typical issue. So here's uh, my colleague Hal. For some reason, he doesn't have a shirt on, and he's got two different scans that are non-visually moved from each other. If you knew how, you would understand. Uh, they have slightly different pieces of the surface that you're seeing, um, and they're they're noisy. Right? This is the trifecta of, of hard, irritating things to work with. Yeah. Um, and so there's a pretty reasonable uh, approach, uh, which is to cycle, just the same way that ICP cycles between fine correspondence and then move stuff. Now we're going to cycle between three things, which is find a correspondence, deform the two guys so that the geometry at the corresponding points looks a little closer, and then do the ICP thing and, 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 and iterate. Yeah? So what's required to do a technique like this is some notion of uh, elastic deformation, right? Because you don't want to take how and fold him in half. Yeah? So there's some energies which are higher, which has to do with the deformation of the underlying surface. Uh, and, and so really these, these uh, uh, techniques just cycle uh, in a totally uh, simple way. For some reason, how slides on this to state the, the same thing about five different ways. Um, yeah, and, and so this is a, a phrase that you'll, you'll see in, in, in practice a lot as, as non-rigid uh, ICP. Uh, and it's extremely hard to do this in practice because if ICP was prone to local optima, this thing is extremely prone uh, to, to local optima, um, which is indeed why it's really easy to fool these face trackers, right? Like if you move too fast, then like you'll get, um, often they'll kind of get clicked out of place. Um, so here's a very simple uh, model, which is the one that appears in his paper, where like you have, you know, Here's the, the, the geometric kind of registration thing where you have like some point to plane motion, some rigid motion, all of that kind of baked into one giant objective. Now you can't use this clever Procrustes problem anymore, so you just throw a generic optimization tool like Gas Newton at it. That gives you some, you know, deformation, and then the other two steps are more or less the same as before in, in ICP. Um, but actually, there's some pretty impressive results. So, like, here they're able to track uh, somebody doing, you know, hopscotch. Um, uh, here, uh, one, one thing that can make uh, ICP a little easier in this non-rigid case is to assume that people give you a template. So like you have some shape that is the full object, and now like, yeah, your scans are partial, but you know they correspond to some piece of the sky, as opposed to partial to partial alignment, which is the more typical scenario. Um, some, sometimes you even have, oops, I don't know what just happened. <laughs> ah, uh, but sometimes in, in the, the most simple case, you have like an extremely basic way of describing something like facial motion. So for instance, if you took our undergrad graphics class, you learned about blend shape models, right? Where you sort of have one mesh for your face, but a bunch of different geometries, like different sets of vertex positions for that. And so you can think of your, your face as a point in R to the 3V, where V is the number of vertices. So in the blend shape world, they do PCA on those long vectors to come up with a bunch of sort of typical ways that faces deform, like open and closed mouth and so on. Uh, and so what they do is they do rigid motion plus just these PCA coefficients. Um, this is one way to reduce the complexity of this problem. And of course, there are many others. So like if you take how and you put a giant sombrero on him, all of these methods will fail. I'm um, not sure where he managed to find uh, that. Or if you, you know, put occlusions and, and, and so on. So these are problems that persist today in, in modern computer vision literature. And, and there's a lot of work uh, trying to address it all across the spectrum from like algorithms that when they succeed give you the global optimum but are kind of slow. Right? These are important in the high detail regime to things that work at 29.97 frames per second so that as I'm interacting in my VR and I want, you know, you look down in the VR and you don't see your sad self but instead you see like Shrek or whatever that like that, that, that registration happens fast enough that, that, that uh, you, you know, you don't suspend disbelief. <laughs> so you have to do off. Okay, so, so with that, uh, that concludes our, our discussion of registration. Um, next time, we're going to talk about correspondence. So like, remember, we talked a little bit about gromov wasserstein distance when we talked about optimal transport. We're going to dig into that quite a bit and, and look at different models for it. Just given two geometric domains, find a permutation of one onto the other rather than a rigid motion to account for really big deformations like matching a horse and a giraffe or something like that. <laughs>